Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Hilton, and I'm going to talk about how to write maintainable code. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself other than to say that I write code. I also think about maintainable code. If you follow me on Twitter, that will make me super happy. Please do that. Um, otherwise, just go to my website and read all my blog posts. So let's dive in. The story about maintainable code starts after you have built some beautiful construction that consists of clean code. So sometimes what happens is that we build something amazing. Yeah, I think you really need the headset. I can shout a bit. Um, sometimes you, you build something amazing, and, and then you realize that somebody's going to have to maintain this. This is a bridge in Scotland, which is famously expensive to maintain. Just painting this thing is kind of almost a continuous job. So building the thing in the first place is a different topic, but what you do for the next five years is usually about writing unmaintainable code. And that's not a good thing. But maybe understanding unmaintainable code is how you're going to understand how to not do that. So let's start there. Now, why would code be unmaintainable? I mean, surely it's going to be nice and simple. But it turns out you get all sorts of reasons why it might not be nice and simple. Now, this is a front page of a newspaper from Luxembourg. Luxembourg is an interesting place for many reasons, but partly because of all of their languages. So the thing about Luxembourgish newspapers is that they're in German, except when they're in French on the same page. Now, that's kind of weird. And that's presumably going to be a bit harder to maintain. If you want to fix stuff in this kind of software, you need people who can do both. You've got more complexity than you bargained on. I mean, until I'd seen this, I didn't even know that was possible. And there are software equivalents. So we get stuff in software. So the software equivalent is when you've just got some new programming environment, some new JavaScript framework, um, and there are lots and lots of new toys. And Imagine taking yourself as a child into this shop and being told you can have as many toys as you like. The natural reaction to this is to just take all of the toys. And as programmers, we tend to want to choose programming languages that give you all of the toys. And we have these, whether it's things like Scala that let you do object-oriented programming and functional programming at the same time, or whether it's JavaScript when you've just got way too many things to choose from. You know, languages that are limiting and environments that are limiting are not really fashionable at the moment. We want lots of stuff. And so we get this, and having all the toys is not necessarily going to help. So to summarize what kind of maintenance problem is inevitable as a result of these modern technologies, is we have different ways of writing code. So we're not sort of writing, doing object-oriented programming or functional programming or doing distributed asynchronous things. We're probably doing all three at the same time. That's like having a newspaper in multiple languages. It's kind of cool, but it's going to be tricky to maintain. And so as our programming languages get more expressive, maybe with the exception of languages like Go that seem to be designed to be more straightforward, but then give you built-in asynchronous stuff that you can get in trouble with anyway, we, no, we end up with just ever more expressive programming languages, things that give us much more opportunity to do complicated things that, frankly, we don't understand. Mm. Also, the languages keep changing. So JavaScript seems to have got to this point where they just have a year in the version number now. ES 2016, ES 2017. This is not the only language that is undergoing rapid change. How do you keep up? Well, you keep up by going to conferences, so you're all absolutely in the right place, and you're going to hear about new things. And then next time you go back to the office, you're just going to use all of these new things, right? Because that's cool. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and partly we have complexity in our communities as well. So the great thing about the where we work and just a room like this is that we don't all have the same background. And it's very rich and interesting when you get input from classical computer scientists, but also people with other science backgrounds or engineers or people who are focused on business stuff. It's very rich, but it's also kind of complicated. And sometimes our goals don't all add up. An example of what goes wrong here is when programmers end up being too clever for their own good. You know, we come up with great solutions, but not everybody else sees it the same way. And so my awesome code is your legacy code. That's what happens. And this happens because we're lazy, 
but we're lazy in a kind of good way. You know, programming laziness is all about avoiding hard work and writing code instead. Um, I often think as a programmer, you know, thank heaven I don't have to work for a living. But sometimes, you know, we're so caught up with the new things and the new toys, starting to play with the new toys, that we don't often finish everything we started. So we've got lots of half-written code in new languages with new technologies, um, and it's starting to get a bit messy. It's lots of fun, so that's sort of why we do it. But there are consequences. And the consequences of all of this kind of chaos and mess and basically a room full of toys all over the floor, which is what most code bases look like inevitably, is that it starts to become expensive to fix things. And just implementing you know, new features starts to take a long time. And when that happens, then it becomes less fun to work on because now you're maintaining code written with three-year-old toys. And then you sort of leave and you go and work on some you know, new startup because that's much more fun. But the company you left has still got to hire new people to replace you and it gets more expensive. And in the end, your code gets even worse. And you go back to step one. And this is, this is what I call the descent into legacy code hell. So this is the problem. This is the problem of maintainable code. And sometimes it doesn't even take very long. But there's good news. The good news is that clean code and automated tests will totally save us. I want to believe that. So well, this is a good place to start. A good place to start is, again, to understand, fully understand unmaintainable code, and then don't do those things. I highly recommend this blog post. Um, it gives you extensive notes on how you can secure your career forever by producing lots of software that nobody else can maintain. Um, also, the slides are online if you're not quick enough with a photo. There, you're too slow. Sorry. Um, so unmaintainable code is something you can start to spot. I mean, you might know about code smells in bad coding styles that suggest you should do refactoring. Well, there are also maintainability smells. So I mentioned, you know, if you can't decide whether to use object-oriented programming or functional programming and your solution is to use both, that's going to be great, but it's going to make it harder to maintain. We all know about the evils of copy-paste code, and when you have repetition, you're going to have a harder maintenance job. Even if you did it for a good reason, it's still harder to maintain. But then if you fix the repetition by adding more abstraction, you've got a worse problem, which is abstraction. Um, and we all know about pasta-related software smells, um, spaghetti code that's tangled, lasagna architecture that has too many layers. I didn't even include ravioli architecture, which is microservices, lots of little small bits swimming in sauce. Um, and although in theory tests will save us, that's easier said than done. And so typically the tests that we have are not good enough. I mean, I always thought, you know, there must be some other project somewhere else where the tests actually have full coverage and they're great. And I started talking to more people, and it turns out that all of us are a little bit of ashamed of at least some of our tests. And some of us are ashamed of all of them. And some of us don't even have them. Ouch. So there's an obvious solution to this, which is popular in certain kinds of enterprise software development. And this is called best practice. Right first time, do something that works, and then continue writing COBOL for the next 30 years. You see, you can avoid these problems if you don't change things. But not changing things is kind of a painful tactic because it means that you have to kind of not learn anything new. And that's a lot less fun. And there's all sorts of things you would have to avoid learning. Every time you change something, you're going to make your code inconsistent because you're going to start doing the new thing, I guess. You know, you've got new people on the team who know new features and libraries. You upgrade the language version. And so these are all things that you should absolutely do. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you should not change anything. I've tried that. It gets really boring really fast. And it's important that we enjoy our jobs. Because if we're not happy, then none of this matters. So we need to be able to deal with these things. Possibly the most significant of these is when the team changes. So um, I've got a functional programming joke here from Sarah May, that your team changes completely every time one person changes. Somebody arrives or leaves, you have a new team, you kind of start again. That's kind of a big deal. And the naive solution is to never change your team. But again, that doesn't work. You can't 
well, you could maybe try to prevent people from quitting their jobs because they hate them, and I recommend you do that, but that's also not an easy solution to a hard problem. What's more likely is to embrace the idea of change and deal with this as well. Now, I mentioned clean code right at the beginning. Um, the good news is that there's a book for that. The bad news is that the book doesn't cover everything, won't solve all of your problems, um, is sometimes just wrong, actually. Which is awkward, because, you know, Uncle Bob is kind of God, but, well, not really. Um, and so, a lot of the discussion is, okay, we're going to have clean code, and this is going to make our code maintainable in the long term. We're going to, for example, have good names for things. This is a core part of clean code, the book, and the practice. But here's the thing. If your solution to maintainable code and not needing documentation, for example, is that you're going to have perfect names, you've just reduced the problem to a harder problem because naming is famously hard, good naming. So if your solution is going to come up with perfect names all the time, then I really want to know how you're achieving this. Good luck with this. Um, you should certainly try, though. It's hard, but all of these are hard things. And hey, we're programmers. We like hard problems. So that's why we're here. So let's do that. Let's solve hard problems. Um, naming things is an awkward topic because despite being famously hard, a lot of us kind of throw our hands in the air and give up and use names that we know are rubbish. But we have tools. My favorite tool on this computer is this Thesaurus. It's pre-installed if you've got a Mac. It's great. It's the best naming tool there is. You can just look up words, and it gives you all sorts of suggestions for refactorings. You can also practice this naming skill by learning more words by playing games. Um, I'm usually being beaten by somebody online in this kind of game. There's an app for this as well. Who knew? Playing games is good because it uh, grows your vocabulary. Um, okay, so let's get a bit more specific about what I'm talking about with the naming problem. We have all sorts of kinds of names that are just bad. So some names are simply meaningless, you know, and we use these. And it's sort of funny the first time, but it's not funny if it's somebody else's code that you're now maintaining and you're trying to work out why there's something called data and why there's something else called data too. And why there's a third thing called data underscore too. Don't do that. Don't do this. You know, we've all seen it. A few laughs, nervous laughs, though. A lot of people really want to use really short names because of the effort of typing. I mean, it's just horrible. You know, typing all day is all we do as programmers. You know, there's extra few characters that's going to kill us. So things that abbreviations like this are simply ambiguous. And ambiguity is not a nice feature. It's a bug, not a feature. Because who knows whether ACC stands for acceleration, account, accumulator, there's all sorts of things. And single letter names are maximally ambiguous. Could mean almost anything. And forget the red herring of the loop index, which is quite often I. I mean, if you're doing loop indexes, what are you, are you writing C code? You know, we have modern languages with collection integration. You know, just having loop indexes in the first place is an anti-pattern, surely. It gets worse, some languages, and I don't need to name names because you know who you are, allow names to be symbolic. So not only are they meaningless, but nobody even knows how to pronounce them. Well, the first one is called right fish. The second one is called spaceship. I can remember that. I just have no idea what they do. Completely give up. The third one is a trick. That's not really a name that I've seen in a programming language, but it is something that actually has a name. It's called the pill crow, the paragraph mark. The others don't have names. We just had to make them up. And then you get these vague words. This is a definite red flag in names, the word manager in a class name. I mean, who honestly knows what a manager does? There is probably a better name, probably something a bit more expressive. Um, so you can fix this if you know more words. The, the method name equivalent is anything that starts with get. It's almost never necessary to use get. Um, I mean, who writes Java code with Java beans anymore? Sometimes, but usually it's just because you couldn't be bothered to think of a better verb. You probably meant find or calculate or derive or estimate or something like that. But get doesn't tell you anything. We already know that it gets something because we probably have a return value. This whole thing about Hungarian notation, nobody uses anymore. 
except when they do, except when they use little prefixes to indicate the type of the thing. Now, if you're using JavaScript, I sympathize. You should probably be using something with type annotations. Um, I hear that's the thing now. Um, if you're doing this in a language like Java or Scala or Go or something, that's just completely unnecessary. No, there's a type that tells you that it's a date. Just call it created. This one's quite a good one that I noticed over years of being the only native English speaker on, on a team, particularly in this country, where you get all these long names with lots and lots of words. I mean, that's really a Dutch thing. Just add more words to make more words. Um, but we do that a little bit less in English. And there's this great hack where you get something like an appointment list because it's a list of appointments. But we have a word for that. It's called a calendar. And a company person, which is a kind of a typical name for a, an entity that's a relationship between two other entities. It's like you've got a company and a person, you have a company person. But maybe that's an employee. You know, we have a word for that as well. And then there's the whole DDD thing about using the correct names in your domain. This is a very rich topic. There are whole conferences just about this bullet point. Um, the fundamental idea is that there's a right name for things and there's a wrong name for things. Um, so I spent quite a while working on a supply chain project, ironically, because straight out of the DDD book, um, it turns out that shipment is not the same thing as an order, and mixing that up gets you horribly confused, or a journey, that's something else again. But a consignment is the same thing as a shipment. You need to be very precise about this kind of stuff. So using the wrong name is just a world of pain. But you can fix this, you can get better. So there are lots of naming smells. All of those things were naming smells. They should be the first thing you spot in code review, and you should fix them all. And I recently received a copy of a PhD thesis from some chap in Australia who'd written hundreds of pages about naming things with science. Um, I didn't read it because it was way too long, but he told me that the key findings were that names should be composed of dictionary words, like just normal words, and there should be three to four words. Not too much, but you should explain a bit what the name is, what it means. And because I'm such a reasonable person, I will allow one abbreviation, which is ID. No other abbreviations. One abbreviation. And ID is tricky anyway, because nobody really knows whether it stands for identity or identifier. So think about that. Mm. It's identifier, by the way, I think. So you can get better, despite that this is the hardest problem in programming, they say. I mean, cache invalidation, that's so solved. Um, but you can get better at this by recognizing and fixing naming. And this refactoring, rename, is the easiest refactoring. At least technically, it always works. You just have to come up with a new name. And it requires courage, so acknowledge that. You're changing something and naming things. You're going to have to talk to your colleagues about this. Um, but there are tools, um, and if you practice, especially if you practice by reading books, you will learn new words and it will become easier. Um, jokes sometimes even help as well, but I'm not going to go there because uh, that would be bad. So write clean code and get better at naming. That's the, probably the best thing you can do to make your code more maintainable. It's the hardest thing, best challenge, but it just involves writing code. Some of the other things I'm going to suggest don't involve just writing code. Early warning. Tests, however, are not so bad because a lot of our tests are sort of code. But the ones that help you most with maintainable code is now adding to the code with some functional tests. Things like Gherkin feature files that describe functionality so that in five years' time, your future self, not even somebody else, just you in five years' time, who will not remember why you have this feature, will be able to look it up and see. Now, this is kind of hard to do, but it's, again, worth doing. And the reason it's worth doing, and this is a great book on the topic, that includes this suggestion that you know, having paper documentation is just a terrible thing. But the only thing worse than that is not having any. And so this is the first clue about what it really means to make code maintainable, is that it's going to be more effort than just making it clean. Anyway, again, this is kind of not so much only a whole presentation, but it's a whole book and a whole conference about testing. But get into that, or at least make sure that you have at least one expert within arm's reach. And write tests, write functional tests that explain why. Because code is notoriously bad at explaining why it exists. It's very easy to write code, well, it's relatively easy to write code that is clear and clean. And I say relatively easy, it's actually quite hard, but it's way easier than writing code where you can read the code, you can understand why we have this code. 
You know, why does this class exist? You can't really put that in code. That's probably a functional test. OK. So unmaintainable code is a huge problem. Writing unmaintainable code is easy. There are lots of different ways you can do it, and lots of quite understandable reasons why you do it. This would be a good time to give you some positive tips. But there's also bad news, because although clean code and tests will save us, they're not enough. You're going to need to do more, and I particularly mean you're going to have to do some more work. And I'm even being you know, optimistic or, or charitable, even assuming that all of your code is clean code. You still need to do more. But actually, it probably isn't all really clean code. Not all the time. Not over the course of several years. And so you're going to have to provide some additional information about what it's all about, what it means, why it's here. So for example, I'm talking about comments. Now, this is a very touchy subject. It's almost a taboo. I, I start arguments easily by just merely suggesting that maybe you should write some comments. Um, a lot of programmers have read Uncle Bob's clean code book and really try hard to believe that Uncle Bob said, Uncle Bob said do not write comments. This is not actually what he said. It's almost what he said. He's misleading. And so if you write clean code, that's fine. That doesn't need comments. But if you want it to be maintainable as well, it's going to need some kind of explanation. Why does this code exist? What else did we try? And the bad news, given how much you all hate comments, is that this is the easiest way to do it. Because comments are in the code. You don't need other tools. You don't need other environments. You can just write them right there. They're right next to what you're talking about. I mean, if your plan for documenting your code involves not doing comments, you're already doing it the hard way. So, I mean, let's start with comments. It's not actually impossible to write a very small amount of comments that are useful. So once you suddenly realize that you've got hundreds and hundreds of classes in your Java application or equivalent, or worse, thousands of files in your JavaScript application, it start, it's time to start adding one sentence, one sentence per file to start with. Why is this file here, whether it's a class or some JavaScript or whatever? Write this sentence, and now try and work out how to make this sentence unnecessary and get rid of it again, and refactor the code and make the code clean. This is the right response. Write the comment, but we don't need this comment if we write the clean code. But you have to actually write the clean code. It doesn't work to say, I don't need comments because I could write clean code, even though I didn't actually do this yet. So if that's your plan, to write clean code, then by all means do that, but have the comments in the meantime, just until you achieve this. And don't forget to, that comments are code. Comments are part of the code. Don't make them separate. Maintain them as part of the code. When they're wrong, delete them or rewrite them. I mean, bad comments are obviously worse than no comments. But if, you, if the best you can achieve with comments is to just delete all of them, not have any, then you're not trying very hard. I mean, this is the only feature that's common to all programming languages. So you should probably figure out how to use it. And very occasionally, you'd need more detail than that. But even just one sentence per class, that's already, a, that's already a start. And just to be clear, this should not be a big effort. I think if you spent five minutes per week on writing documentation in comments, you would be a lot better off, and your code would be a lot less bad. So I'm not asking much, but I am asking to think about maintainable code. We've had do not repeat yourself dry, drummed into us for years. And this is a great thing, because repetition can be a problem in code. It's a maintenance burden. The thing is, is that the alternative is sometimes worse. If you've got repetition, duplication in the code, you probably need to fix this with some abstraction. So you make an abstraction, and you remove the duplication. But now you've got a new thing in your code, and new things need new names. And naming is hard, as you know. And so sometimes you end up with stuff like this. So this is a snippet from a World Wide Web Consortium specification that says a shadow root is always attached to another node tree through its host. A shadow tree is therefore never alone. I have no idea what this is about. This is crazy documentation. Um, presumably, there's some kind of specification about something that's so abstract that they had to just make, make up some new abstract 
some new abstraction to explain it, and it's not explained. This is not helping. You're probably doing this in your code if you're abstracting everything and never having duplication. And so there's this big risk that too much abstraction and never ever repeating yourself will lead to things that you just don't know how to name. I mean, even if, even if it was part of the domain, naming's so hard, but if you're adding all these extra abstractions that are just basically fake, because the real world does have duplication, then you're making things worse. So the solution to this is to step back just a little bit and apply the rule of three. The rule of three is that when you see duplication once, you let it be, you leave it there, because you don't know from two occurrences what the abstraction is. By the time you've got the third occurrence, one of the others has probably changed anyway, and you don't really have the same thing three times. When you see the same thing three times, and it really is the same thing, then you refactor, not before. The maintenance cost of maintaining two things that are the same is lower than the maintenance cost of bad abstraction. Both of these are higher than not having that maintenance cost, and you don't have that if you have 10,000 lines of code because you've just spent a month or two coding. But after a few years, this is a big deal. This is a problem. So apply the rule of three before you get aggressive about duplication. This will help you a lot. It will make your life a lot easier. Also, you won't have to spend so much time agonizing over what is the right name for your new class, which you should do. You should agonize over the names of new classes. And you should also create new classes, in fact. Because if you don't, you'll end up with classes and source code files that are 10,000 lines long. And nobody wants that. But we all have it. And so the, the, the underlying lesson here is that if clean code is our starting point, that will get you through year one. But the next five years are going to need more. They're going to need clean code that is also maintainable. And to make it maintainable as well as clean, you're going to have to do more work. You're going to have to explain more. You're going to need shock. Things like comments. And it gets worse. Then you're going to have to actually maintain it. Right? So you've made this code, you've set it up to be maintainable because it's not only clean, but it's explained and supported. Um, think about then the next five years after that. What happens? Well, what tends to happen, actually I'm being nice, what always happens, in my experience, is that you start off with this clean code, and then it gets a little less clean, and you get a sort of percentage of not clean code. And then at a certain point, somebody says, we'll clean it up later. This is the beginning of the end of the code maintainability of your code base. Because before you know it, somebody says, oh, it's a mess. Well, we can't fix this now. I think this is inevitable. I don't think it's possible to change the shape of this graph. I mean, I've been writing code on projects for more than 20 years. It's a lot of projects, and this always happens in my experience. But what we can do, I'm feeling positive today, what we can do is we can influence the time axis. We can delay the inevitable. We can delay it for long enough. How long is long enough? Well, that's a good question that we usually forget to ask. When you start coding a project, you're working on a project, and you have business stakeholders, you need to ask, what is the expected or desired lifetime of this system? Can we throw it away after three months because it's a marketing campaign? Can we throw it away after five years because it's a product that will be replaced? Or are we going to have to maintain this for 30 years because it's a baggage handling system at a major airport and we're never going to change it? This is an important question, and this means that how far should you try and push this? If you're too aggressive, you could waste money on making it maintainable, but then you throw the code base away which is obviously what we all prefer, is just starting again from scratch. That's the, that's the nice solution. So 100,000 lines of code. This is my gut feeling about when, when the cliff starts to happen, and it happens quite quickly if you don't actively push back. And also, that's kind of a number that makes a difference between different kinds of software. Business applications where you're doing some kind of iterative development and you've got a product owner who's giving you features, if you keep doing this for years, you just get more and more code. It just always grows. You can maybe slow it down, but it grows. But if you have some kind of library, some kind of technology, at a certain point, it will be done. And it will probably be done in less than 100,000 lines of code. So for example, here's the lines of code count for a full stack Scala web framework. It does quite a lot. It's quite a big framework. It's quite a big library. It's still 60,000 lines of code. And that's even including blank lines of code and comments and stuff, which maybe sort of count. 
I mean, the, the, the core of this is less than 50,000 lines of code. You can do this on a library, but not on a business application. OK, so how do we push back? We push back one day at a time by keeping each other honest, by not making the code worse. Code review is about as good as it gets, unless you're able to do a lot of pair programming, which you should certainly try, because it really works. It's just soul-destroying and tiring. So you can't do it for eight hours a day. Um, so that's not realistic. But in any pair programming you do is really worth it. Code review everything. And then follow the Boy Scout principle. The principle that you should leave the campsite cleaner than you found it. The principle that every pull request should be an overall improvement on the code. Every pull request should achieve the initial goal at the same time as making some slight improvement. Because if you're not getting slightly better, you're getting slightly worse. Or maybe even you're getting a lot worse. And the keys to this are learning to recognize code smells, actually recognizing them in code review, which means you have to do the code review, actually commenting on those without annoying your coworkers so they hate you and don't make the changes, and then you have to actually do the refactoring. And this is quite a few steps. It's quite easy to kind of skip these or only get halfway. Refactoring is kind of hard because of the human social reasons, not because of the technical reasons. And so what this does is it lets you lose more slowly in the sense that you can stretch out the time axis of that chart that I completely made up, by the way. But you can, you know, kind of prolong the, the period of clean code in which it's nice to work on the project, after which everything disintegrates and everybody leaves the project because it becomes horrible. And so what you're trying to do is to keep the code base small, and as the code base grows, spend more time on refactoring. So here's another made-up number for you. In year one on your project, you do not really need to do a lot of refactoring. In year two, you should maybe spend 10% of your team hours on refactoring. And then you should add 10% of the team hours every additional year. After five years on your code base, spend half your time on refactoring. Because otherwise, it's going downhill. It's time for a bit of audience participation. So just to check, um, if you can hear me, stick your hand up. Right, okay, okay, so control. Keep your hand up if, you know, you're working on a, if you're a programmer. Actually, that's a good one. Okay, so you write code. Keep your hand up if you, if you work on a code base that's um, uh, less than a month old. Okay, nobody. Okay, keep your hand up if it's more than a month old. So everybody's working on this thing. Keep it up if it's more than a year old. What, more than two years old? Five years old? Not so many hands, okay, me neither now. What about more, more, more than eight years old? A couple of people. So there's this sort of exponential drop-off, but some of us work on code bases that are around for a lot longer, where this stuff becomes progressively harder and more important. But it becomes important during year one. Okay, now I have to talk about documentation. I mean, I softened you up with comments, but documentation, it's a thing. Um, and I understand that none of you like writing documentation. I don't even need a show of hands for that. Um, except for me. I like writing documentation. I do it for you. I take one for the team and I write the docs. It turns out that there's some innovation in documentation that, like many innovations in how we build software, involves doing less and avoiding the waste. The most exciting of which is readme-driven development, in which you don't write too much docs and you don't write none at all. You write almost none. Now, by readme, I'm thinking of the one-page version of the whole documentation. And actually, if it's open source software, then this literally is a markdown file in a GitHub repo called README. It's a couple of screens. It hardly has anything in it. And figuring out how to do this is very useful. It takes a bit of effort, but actually it's not so hard. And you can solve all of the problems with documentation if you just hardly have any, but have maybe just enough. So you basically need to introduce the system and explain what it's for and why it exists and what it does. And then you've answered most of the questions, and the rest is in the code, probably. And sometimes you need additional documentation, because a lot of systems have one additional thing that's complicated or interesting. And there's a kind of documentation for that. But most systems that survive more than a few months um, need maybe one of these additional kinds of documentation. You know, we used to try and write all of them, which was a lot of fun for people like me who liked writing documentation. And the programmers hated it, like the normal programmers. Um, and trying to delegate it to the normal people, the non-programmers. So write minimum viable documentation. You know, channel lean software development into your maintenance and documentation approach. Write hardly any. 
Spend 10 minutes a week on the documentation. Or even better, figure out which person on the team hates it the least and have them write all of the documentation. So on my team, that's me. And everybody's happier because of this. Um, this kind of makes sense as well. Technical writing is a specialist skill, like user interface design. But if you look around your team, you wouldn't have everybody do the user interface or user interaction design. Because you've probably got a colleague who's sitting there with you know, editing code in Vim or Emacs who kind of never touches the mouse. This is not the person to be designing your graphical user interface. By the same person, the person who, by the same token, the person who has never written documentation or even maybe read a book in their lives is not the person you want writing your docs. And the person who likes it more than the others might get better at it and like it more. So to summarize, because we're close to out of time, the bottom line is that we don't like other people's code. That's what we call legacy code. I mean, there's lots of versions of what legacy code means, but it's pretty much anything written by anybody else, um, but including kind of past you. I think after about two years, code you wrote two years ago yourself becomes legacy code because presumably you're learning things continuously, and two year old, two, well, you from two years in the past is also now somebody else. So the summary of how to fix this, how to deal with this, is to understand what unmaintainable code is and write clean code instead, but then go beyond merely writing clean code and make it maintainable with some tests, with the right amount of duplication, um, additional effort to make it maintainable beyond merely developing the features. And um, a minimum but non-zero amount of documentation and maybe even comments. I mean, comments, try it, you know, just maybe it works for you. And, and really resist the, growth, the inevitable growth of the code base. Okay. So this is already quite a long list, so I decided to summarize the summary. And the summary of the summary is, is simply first write clean code, make it maintainable, and then don't forget to actually maintain it. This is more work. I have one more thing for you. It's a bit off topic, but hey, since I've got the stage. Um, the only thing cooler than Amsterdam is Rotterdam. Yes, and in June, we have the joy of coding, where you can find out more about how to make coding joyful, because if you enjoy the code, it's more likely to be maintainable. Go to Joy of Coding. I'll see you there. Anyway, that was all I have. Thank you very much. We could try questions if you have any. I mean, I'm here all day, so if you're shy, just find me during the day and ask. Or you can ask now if you have a fake question where you'd like to kind of, you know, show off in front of everybody. Anybody? No. Okay, that's good too. Oh, we have a question. Okay. What is my thought on short variable names that are okay because they're standard? Well, they're still bad, right? So I, as a loop index, suggest that you're using loop indexes when you should be iterating over collections in a modern programming language. If you still have a loop index, now I want to know what it is. Actually, you're looping over something, so name the index. If your variable name is A, well, that only works in very narrow fields. So if you're within a narrow domain, your class is about geometry, for example, you've got a point in two-dimensional space, then now we know what X and Y means. You know, this is kind of the only time when a one-letter name is well-defined within your domain. However, even then, barely, because this is like saying, well, mathematicians do it. In mathematics, all names are one letter. And this is true. You have formulas with one-letter names, and if you do proofs, you see single-letter identifiers. And when you run out of alphabet, you just use more alphabets. You go Greek letters, and you do the Hebrew letters. But what you're forgetting is that this is preceded by hundreds of words of explanation in English sentences comments by any other name. So if you're going to use one-letter names, that's fine. I want about 100 words comment per one-letter name explaining it. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, no problem at all. Uh, anything else? Yes. You mentioned uh, the fact about... Um, A shout, I can't hear. Uh, you mentioned... Is this Not on. Oh. Okay, you're mentioning the fact that uh, uh, writing maintainable uh, code and it also has to go with the writing uh, proper documentation for it, but what if the customer doesn't have an infrastructure to, uh, to organizationally, doesn't have or doesn't value documenting their own processes? And how do you handle when you are in a situation where you are actually trying to volunteer 
change that the customer is not really, uh, doesn't see much value in it and okay. doesn't want to invest in it. So I, th I think I understand the question is, what if the customer doesn't have the infrastructure or the ability to provide, for example, documentation or doesn't value the documentation and doesn't want to pay for it? This is fine. You can deliver clean code. You need to explain that the lifetime of this code is limited and it will not be maintainable code. You don't have to make maintainable code. It's only for the group of you in the room who needed your software to be around next year. So it is optional. And this is one of the horrors of, for example, Scrum for people used to software development 20 years ago. They used to get all of this explanation and documentation for free. Well, not free. They had to pay for it and projects failed. But they didn't have to ask for it. Now they have to ask for it and choose to pay for it. So yes, they don't have to do so. But they have to make a business choice to pay for the infrastructure and the time. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's carry on the conversation afterwards because we're sort of run out of time, I think. Okay, well, thanks again.